<laughs> Thank you. Well, hello everybody. How you doing? Happy Mean Green Friday. And I'm like just so proud. I almost need sunglasses to get rid of all the bright green in the room. It makes me feel like I'm back in the Emerald City in Oz. Oh no, systems Oz. Never mind. Um, that was a joke, Lisa. I'm laughing. Uh, I'm laughing inside. Though. So today we're here for our, with our first town hall that we've ever done like this. And I just want to say thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoy it. We hope we learn. And we hope we can all get better by having these types of town halls. Um, this format that we're using today, uh, we actually had a very carefully prepared format that I think I've just completely <laughs> thrown out. Um, <laughs> We were going to start with employee engagement questions and comments and, uh, uh, that were centering around how we can become a great place to work. Uh, and then we were going to move on into system issues. Uh, it's our belief up here that maybe the first thing we ought to do is move into some of the relationships that we have between system and the campuses and how we can improve by working together better and doing the things we have to do to improve our services and delivery for all of you. So we're going to start with that. Uh, and after that, uh, depending on kind of how much time we have, we'll move into some of the uh, topics that we have put together around employee engagement. The other thing was we solicited from all of you questions, uh, uh, issues that you wanted to hear how we addressed around the various services that we deliver to the units uh, on campus. And we diligently did that. We have many. And in some cases, we had to take some questions that came up, oh, time and time and time again, <coughs> and just put them and put a little star by them so we knew that they were really popular. But uh, we also want to make sure that we capture the spirit of the moment. and so what we're going to do after a little warm-up is we'll actually be engaging you directly in questions and we want to hear from the audience so that you know we weren't like scripting our own questions and giving you the answers we wanted that we're going to answer the questions that you really uh, are interested in and that you want to ask uh, and we're all very comfortable with that so I'm going to begin by just asking for uh, my fellow panelists this is Laura Wright, who's our regent, who's the vice chair of the Board of Regents, and is amazing and helpful, and in every single way, I consider her to be a model regent. Uh, her background <laughs> is that she was the CFO of Southwestern Airlines, so she knows her way around finances and running large and complicated organizations, and uh, she brings not just years of experience, but also years of understanding how successful organizations move, how they build great employee engagement, and how to solve problems uh, in an organization as dynamic as Southwest Airlines. And she's now graduated to doing a hundred other things. Most important to us is being a regent advocate for us, which we really appreciate. And of course, we have our chancellor. And I don't know if I can call you our new chancellor anymore. Yeah. You know, there comes a time... Don't call me old chancellor, though. <laughs> Okay, our new chancellor, <laughs> new and young chancellor, uh, Lisa Rowe, who I think most of you have met or have seen or have heard from. Uh, we had a nice reception for her here not long ago. Lisa has come in. Uh, she's really pulled the president and cabinet, uh, system cabinet team together in ways that uh, I know the presidents are finding deeply gratifying. Uh, and she's rolling up everyone's shirt sleeves to get ready to do the um, hard but rewarding work of building a really effective system. And so today's an important day for Lisa because she needs to hear from us, uh, hopefully in um, collegial tones, uh, what is going on, how we feel, and what we can do to make both UNT and our system uh, better places from an operational perspective so that we can support our mission. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to proffer up some initial comments from our panelists about what we're doing here and I'm going to start with the system role if that's all right with you two. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I, 
I would like to start by just asking uh, our chancellor to first comment briefly on what she feels is our system mission and what we hope we can achieve uh, through working together. So um, we've had a lot of uh, discussions coming in. When I, you know, just coming in, um, we would talk about the system. And typically, um, it was uh, those system people. And I'd be like, who are they? And we need to get them, you know, because uh, it was kind of in that tone that it was talked about coming in. And, uh, and so really, um, then, of course, I realized that was me, I guess. So, so the point is, what we, what we really did is some great work both with the presidents, a lot of conversation about what do we really think the system is, and some conversations with our vice chancellors um, at a retreat, and, and various things about talking about the system so we could really get to, to really where do we want to know. First, you've got to know what it is before you figure out where you're going to go with it, right? So, so that came up with actually the visual that you see right up there on the screen, because the visual is the integration of all of our universities. And that's what we all felt passion around. The, you know, the system is us, and that's what it is. Um, it's, it's the, like I said, the integration of all of, the, of all of our three universities, and then the intersection being the services that we provide to those universities. And so we really talked about that. When we talk about it, um, everything I do, we had these conversations, everything I do as chancellor is for one of our universities, or for the whole, for the integration of the whole. That's the whole purpose that we're here. And, um, and so the same thing for our services. It's all about providing what we need for our universities, really. And so it's all about our mission, our mission being our students, um, and, and really focusing on producing those students, changing the lives of those students, enabling those students to have a, a great future, and also producing the workforce that we need in this rapidly growing region that we're in. So all of that is kind of around our mission and around what we see as what our system actually is. Um, so uh, did you want me to kind of jump into some of the priorities of that? I can't remember not, if you asked that yet. question. Not yet, okay. Um, <laughs> but I think I love that you said the job of the system is to support the good work that each of the units are doing oh, so that our students can thrive. Exactly. Um, I think that That's why is we're here. why we're all here. Uh, I want to just turn to Laura and say, Laura, you've been on the board now for uh, long enough to know um, under different administrations. Uh, and the board obviously has a lot of conversations about shared services and what the system should be and what it can do and what your hopes and dreams and aspirations are for the units. Uh, could you talk to me a little bit about your perspective as a region on what the top priorities for system uh, should be what the, and how the Board of Regents view uh, the kinds of transformation we hope to make. Yeah, so certainly um, I think we're, we're very aligned with the Chancellor um, in terms of what we think and President Smotrisk and our other presidents in terms of what the priorities are. We, again, the most important thing are our campuses. If without the campuses there wouldn't be a system and that's what we exist for. So we want to end when we say, what are the campuses? It's about um, education. It's about our students. Um, we want them to get a great education. We want them to have marketable skills. We want them to contribute to society. I mean, all those things um, that we all care deeply about. But we also have other things we do on our campuses, research, you know, artistic creativity and all that. But that's number one, is we've got to focus. And the system is a support operation. It is not the front line. And, and that's very similar to my role um, at Southwest Airlines. <coughs> our focus was on our customers and running an airline. And lot, we all had roles in it, but it all came down to what was our real purpose. And, and, and uh, so I think the regents are 100% aligned that we exist for the campuses. Uh, you may ask, well, why do we even have a system? Well, there's. It's, we have three very different campuses. Um, we have a med, uh, the Medical Center in Fort Worth. We have UNT Dallas with the new law school. Um, and of course, we have our flagship here um, in Denton. And, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about shared services and, and some of those things. But um, if you come from the private sector where, where I have, um, what we, the role that the regents see the system can help is to allow people like President Smotris, 
Bob Mong, all of you out here to spend your time on those core mission and not so much time on all the administrative functions and so forth. So that's where we really have an opportunity um, as a system, and we'll talk more about where we are in that, to, um, to be a customer service center and allow our campuses to be successful. Um, so I've got a couple more questions for both of you before we kind of move into double jeopardy and start getting questions from the field. Um, what I'd like to ask uh, Lisa is, you know, you've moved in now, you've had a pretty good period to hear from everybody. Uh, you haven't yet necessarily completely engaged the field, but you've certainly heard from your cabinet and the presidents. So after integrating all that information, what are your top priorities now for the UNT system? Yeah, so I've, I've had four months. <clears throat> and I keep saying that just for people to make sure they know how long, how long uh, and it's been a rapid four months. But, uh, but really, um, my priorities are really the priorities that I was given by the board. And those priorities, uh, of course, you know, we talked about our priority being our students. That's our current, kind of our core mission. But our priorities around growing enrollment, um, growing our graduation rate, growing, uh, that, that's kind of aligned with that one, um, growing our research and development, growing our foundational assets, our top programs, uh, being the best place to work and uh, having an efficient and effective system. So those were the, those were the key uh, priorities that the board gave me coming in. Um, and I think they're excellent, excellent priorities and ones that I, getting together with the presidents, we did a lot of work around our strategy, you know, as I came in within the first month and talking about really where we're headed. And we all agreed, uh, myself and the presidents, that we really want to align around those board goals and where we're headed. And so we have key actions that each of our, our presidents have put in place to achieve those goals that we were given by the board. Uh, and, and we presented those in November. Uh, and it was, I think, one of the best boards that, at least from what I heard from the board, is one of the best boards that we've ever had because we were really really aligned with what they were thinking, focused on the students. We had students uh, there with us at that board. And, uh, and so I think they were really excited to hear what was happening at the universities around the goals that they've set for us. And so, so we, we, we had uh, tremendous work there. Each of the presidents, uh, well, matter of fact, we, we kind of, and again, being the system, the integration of those, we really rolled those goals and what's happening at each of our universities and where we're headed. And we set kind of a, a goal for 2020 and I'll, I'll name, a, you know, name some of that just so people are kind of aware if you didn't get a chance to see what was happening at the board. And that was enrollment for overall for our overall all system is, is going to grow by 10% or get to 48,000. Uh, degrees awarded will get to over 11,000, around, uh, around a 13% growth. Our R&D growth is going to get to almost 124 million, or that's around a 37% growth. Uh, our foundational assets are targeted uh, towards around a 44% growth. And, um, and we all uh, agreed that uh, we're focusing on a best place to work by 2020. Um, and so we can, that, you know, we'll get more into that conversation a little later today. And we have some key goals uh, around efficient and effective system um, that, would, that, again, we'll get more into uh, a little bit later in some of the question lines um, so that I can, you know, kind of elaborate on. But each of the presidents um, have, have key actions around all of those and we'll report at each goal how we're moving forward with those actions and just give you a flavor because I certainly can't cover all of those, a flavor of what kind of each president, uh, President Williams, very much focused on our new medical school. Uh, at the Health Science Center uh, this year, really focused on getting, getting that through the coordinating board, um, the higher ed coordinating board, uh, improving the pr productivity of research faculty, uh, very much focused on partnerships. Now, again, um, at our Health Science Center, they're not growing enrollment, but they're growing GME slots. We really need those intern slots. Uh, so so uh, President Williams is doing a great job forming up partnerships um, with Different, um, different medical, uh, different hospitals to really get those, G grow those GME slots. So that's, that's going along really great. And, um, and also focused on growing our foundation through endowments, naming gifts, um, and alumni donors are all kind of going on at the Health Science Center. Um, here, I mean, you guys know probably even better than I, but President Smotrix talked very much about, you know, his recruiting plan, his uh, market automation through Salesforce CRM, international recruiting, growth in Frisco, 
uh, improving the communi co community college transfers uh, with the Toyota Lean process, expanded expanding uh, college offerings for regional needs, very much focused on that. We talked about that earlier today. The Residence Hall, Eagle Visitor Center, uh, fo uh, focusing on productivity of our principal investigators and building research capacity through uh, high impact hires, research institutes with the Autism Spectral Spectrum Disorders Research Institute, expanding doctoral funding, new wing at Discovery Park for biomedical engineering, DOD large scale funding, a corporate research strategy um, that I've been really working closely with, with the advanced development people across all the, uh, all, all three of our universities actually, patents and licensing. So just a number of key things going on, and I barely, you know, probably didn't scratch the surface there, but those are some of the things we talked to the board about. And then, um, of course, President Mung at UNT Dallas, very much focused on reaching that growth target, has a 5,000 person target um, there by 2020, and uh, has record enrollment already here in the spring. 11% um, growth from last spring, so he's well on the way there to achieving the key goals that they have uh, set in place there, aligned with the board goals. And also focusing on the five priority programs that they have at UNT Dallas there, from law, bilingual education, logistics, mental health, public health are all key focuses that uh, President Mung has. So that's, that's really our goals that we have with, and we have lined those up with what the board is looking for and, and our goals uh, and where we're headed over the next, you know, you know from to, to 2020. Yeah, and I, I just want to say um, the strategic planning exercise was pretty easy um, in that it was a series of goals and targets that our university has and we were able to express them in simple terms with action items around them. So uh, I think the presidents all really appreciated uh, and I know the regents appreciated the clarity uh, that that afforded us. Um, so with that I want to uh, turn one more time to Laura before we open it up and just say uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Laura's an alum. Go mean green. and. <coughs> What I, I, I kind of want to mm, switch gears just a little. Uh, we can talk in kind of strategic planning terms and very uh, antiseptic ways about our goals and numbers and metrics. Uh, but as an alum, what is it that you really want most for your alma mater? What is it that you look forward to seeing happen here and how do you think we're going to get there and, and how can the system help that happen? Yeah, no question. So um, I, I, um, when I, when I get an opportunity to talk to people about myself, which is not my favorite thing to do, um, I, always, I always mention how I really consider myself one of the most lucky persons ever, you know, just from so many, from so many events in my life, starting with, um, being born to unbelievable parents. Um, but one of the things that I, that I always look at and, and, and saw as a turning point in my life was my experience here at UNT. I had an incredible time here um, and I got a great education and I was well prepared and it wasn't just the education but it was a work ethic, it was the ability to communicate, work with other folks but, and, and I, my best friends today are those that I made here um, because I kind of grew up here. Um, so I'm, I'm very fond um, of UNT, and um, certainly um, I'm very excited about where we sit today. I think UNT, um, and, and I'm gonna talk about the other campuses too, we have the best leaders that I've seen since I graduated, and that's huge. <coughs> and we are, um, you know, I think about the, uh, I mean it. <laughs> We do, <laughs> and um, but we are. I think we're in a really envious situation. If you look at colleges and university, universities around the country, we're sitting in North Texas, which is this. We're on fire right now. We've got companies coming in, and and what a great place to be in higher ed. I mean, and I just see us at a point where we can make such a difference in the community, and such a difference in changing the lives of young folks like it did for me. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pumped, you know, whether it's athletics, whether it's growing advancement. I mean, Chancellor Rowe talked about the priorities we have. And those of you who have been to a Board of Regents meeting, you know, um, 
it's pretty hard to get nine people that are all type A personalities to see things the same way. And, um, but I will tell you, as we uh, embarked on our search for a new chancellor and, and thought about what we wanted and the priorities, we actually agreed pretty quickly. And um, in terms of what's important, again, the top thing is students, and we need a system that's focused on the reason we exist, which is our campuses. We want to grow advancement. We're all, you know, we, we think that we should be in a lot different spot than we are based on our size and the amount of alumni um, that we have out there. But we have to give them something to be proud of, to want to give money. You know, so it just you just can't, you know, it's, it's all those things. We're tier one research. We want to stay there. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm so proud of this university, but I'm also just think we have such an opportunity to take it to another level. And again, to your first question, which I haven't really answered, I think it's all about the brand equity of your degree. We all want to feel really great that we have a degree from UNT, and you want to be proud to tell people you graduated from there, and also that you work for UNT. So that's, that's kind of a, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what I wanted to That's a great say, answer. So. Um, and, and you know, it, it, it makes me incredibly happy that there's an alum uh, or a few alum on the board because I know that you care really deeply and personally about our future uh, and that you're involved and engaged in a positive way with trying to help us to do that mission that changes lives and gives people opportunities to excel. Uh, so we now want to start moving into what I'm going to call the tough questions. Now let me, let me give you a little setup. Um, we solicited questions and we got a lot uh, of questions. Um, we got questions about virtually every component of shared services. And a lot of what we got focused on uh, either the perceived gaps in shared services or the promise of what shared services should become or simply questions about what are we going to do to make them better. Uh, th and, and, and I'm going to give you just a quick overview of that and, and then say, um, I'm going to ask Chancellor Rowe for a quick an assessment of our shared services because I think that's a fair start before we start asking more fine-grained kinds of questions. So we got a ton of questions around payroll uh, and financial processing. Uh, we got questions around IT. I would say the largest number of questions we got concerned HR uh, and uh, challenges that folks in the field felt that they had about them. Uh, we got some specific questions about whether things were going to devolve back to the university uh, or where you thought things best belonged, whether they were, should be centralized or that you know, we should move them back. Um, we got questions about our ability to respond when there were problems and our perceived lack of nimbleness. So, you know, there were, there were a number of issues. And then the, some got very specific, and, and I'm going to kind of step back from those because, you know, there's a long list and I don't need to be talking about whether the phone numbers for system are right, okay? <laughs> um, so you've heard this, you've heard it from the presidents. We've been having a series of, I call them, good strategic planning meetings around uh, how we use shared services. What's your initial assessment of shared services? Um, what's on the table? And where do you think things are going here in the next few months? Sure, so, so coming in, um, kind of the first thing was to kind of get my arms around what was happening there. Cl I had a clear goal, as I, as I talked about, from the, from the board, which was an efficient and effective system. And, uh, and so what, what I've been doing, at, at, you know, as part of that is, is understanding. So kind of coming in, uh, you know, as President Smotrick said, we, you know, I talked to the presidents, um, uh, had kind of reviews from week one about understanding what it is we had as a system, and then um, really moved more into pulling together system by system users of the system, um, subject matter experts that are actually in the system office, folks down, uh, you know, at the folks from the universities coming in, the presidents, CFOs. I've been wearing the CFOs out, but they've been in a number of uh, all of those sessions, really trying to understand, 
you know, where we are. Um, the, the focus on all of these have been very much around, you know, where can we, where, you know, being open, not, not being defensive, really understanding what the issues are, um, and trying to prioritize those issues. Um, uh, and, um, and really, where, where can we, uh, everything from where is the structure uh, really draw, you know, where we have a lot of breaks in the structure and things fragmented. Um, I, you know, was given a, a key, key goal by the board, to, you know, focus on delayering, cost effectiveness, um, really looking at how, you know, and, and customer service, right, and what, and really what that means. Um, so we've been looking at all of that, including, you know, governance and, and really defining what's a simple structure for governance and how can we make sure customer service is a part of that governance. Um, and so customer service, I'm still rolling up my sleeves and trying to, trying to figure that out and employing folks to come in and kind of help me with that because there's, there's kind of this things that you want, it's, it's really what's the purpose of, you know, what are the key measures you want to have and what areas you don't want to overwhelm yourself from that standpoint or wear people out, but what are the key things that matter the most to us and, and what are we, tr is, is, is this feedback because we want to quickly change something or is it more you kind of need it more on an annual basis? So there's, there's all kinds of things to look at from that regard. So we've been doing all of those things uh, system by system. One of the first things I realized that we really needed to put in place is a, is, uh, a chance, I call it a chancellor's council. Um, and so we, no, November we had that in place where the presidents are there with me, um, the system CFO is there. Um, and we have um, our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and we also have legal in the room. And really the goal of that is so that we can all discuss and make decisions as a body. I mean, I really, that's, that's really fundamentally what we're doing because, I mean, I think what, what was loud and clear coming in is the presidents had not feel, felt included in a lot of the things around our services. So I wanted to change that um, um, you know, immediately, and that's what we did. Um, and, uh, and so I think, Really, it's been a great team, and we're figuring out which things we want to queue up for that Chancellor's Council and when. And as we've reviewed each system, um, we're we're looking, like I said, we kind of go through the brainstorming, the getting getting pl doing some plotting on the board, come back, and then bring those things that we're ready to go ahead and make decisions on to the Chancellor's Council, decide, and lay out an implementation plan for those. Because some of those things can't happen all night, we need to think through that implementation. Communication is a key part of that implementation plan because we need to talk with all of you guys. You know, as we decide to move forward with something, here's how it's gonna play out. Uh, some of those things we, we said, yeah, we wanna do those right away. Some of those things we said, that's really important, but that's gonna be kind of the phase two of this. And so we're prioritizing those. Um, as President Smotrich said, HR probably was one of the things that we, we said there were, I mean, and I heard that um, you know, not only from the universities, but I heard that from the, from the uh, vice chancellors as well. I had a retreat with them that said, hey, one of the first things we need to really work on is onboarding, you know, so that, that's become a, pri matter of fact, the first thing ahead of that is our, our HR data, our HR data in our system because there were some is been some issues with our data. So, there, so we're really prioritizing some of those things and, and focusing some of those things first, but we'll move through. There's gonna be changes, I think, in each of the areas, and it's gonna be different levels of changes. So um, there may be where we, some of it's really more about communications, and it's really how we wanna talk about our communications. Uh, other things are more around, we need to, a structural change. Um, we need, um, we wanna change some thresholds with what, from approvals, we wanna, we want to actually we want to look at again. It's about driving efficiencies and effectiveness. So some of those things may be where we want our student-facing uh, organizations down at our universities. We can drive some uh, some efficiencies across those and effectivity with actually interfacing with our students if we did we've, if we did some things differently there, say in the student accounting arena or something like that. So we we're, we're, we've got some things that we're queuing up and getting ready to kind of move on with that regard. But then the things behind that, the core systems we want to keep more where you don't have everybody having one of those and that gets very costly. And, in, and instead we might, by, by the way, shared services doesn't mean that you do that say you know, uh, at, the, at some systems shared services level. It may be where you have one campus do it for all the campuses, right? That's, that's shared service. So, so I think it's all of the above that we're looking at and we're making decisions around 
trying to get efficiencies of where there's single systems that make sense, trying to look at interfaces where it's important to keep that interface local uh, and you can find efficiencies there more at the local level, more at the campus level. And, uh, and so those are the kind of things that we've been working on, laying them all out. Uh, my plan is, again, we'll bring forward the, the progress in February to the board on uh, some of the key, th key things we've been, we're laying out for finance, uh, probably for, for facilities. Those are some of the things that we're more ready to move on. Uh, HR and IT are still ones that are kind of really in work right now and we're still making some calls. Our whole redefining some of our governance uh, and where we might want to clean sheet some of that is, is in work still. And of course customer service, that's really one that, that fundamentally is still in work. And we're also looking, you know, audit and legal are still where we're going to have a sit down on that and have some discussions around those. Um, probably missed something. Oh, and business services kind of is already one that we're probably ready to to make some decisions and move forward with some of that. So that's kind of how we've laid it out. By May, I think we'll be done kind of with the reviews. But I want to be clear, though, when I say we'll be done, because I think some, some folks, I talk about our mission is our students, right? And, uh, and fundamentally, that's where we're going to you know, be focused. Um, there's always going to be the pressure to be as efficient and effective everywhere else. That is going to be constant. We're going to always want to do that. So continuously improving our shared services is, is always going to be what we're doing. So it's not going to be, okay, we're done, we, got, we, got, we nailed it, we're, we're not going to ever look at shared services again because that would not be, if we say that we're going we're gonna to be kind of a decaying and dying organization, right? We want to be one that's focusing on where can we incorporate automation, where can we incorporate improvements, how can we get more efficient, how can... <coughs> always trying to focus with putting more money back into our the mission of our students right so that's a long-winded answer but there's been a lot going on in this first four months around this and I can elaborate if if there were more questions around that well if I had to summarize like from the president's viewpoint yeah yeah um, when we sat down Lisa said everything's on the table you know we're gonna look at everything and every solution and we're gonna do what makes sense which I thought was both incredibly refreshing but also really important because if all we were doing was saying we'll look at shared services and we'll do a little tweak here and there and it's all going to be called good um, that that wouldn't have delivered and and so I think that we're poised to make deliberate and thoughtful changes that could be deeply substantive at times and I, and I think it might be fair to say where that's going to happen we're not maybe always going to broadcast every detail of that right off because a lot's involved and people are involved and so you have to have some sensitivity right. around uh, the speed of change and how you execute it. That's right. Uh, you said communication, which is key. Um, so that's one part. The other part... Yeah, um, can I say something? Oh, well? sure. So I, I just want to say from a regent perspective, um, I will tell you that we know that the shared service has not been uh, has been rough and it's been rocky and um, and a little bit of fairness to the system employees um, they were probably given w way too big of a task to do in too short of a time too many competing priorities and um, we are very aware that the customer service hasn't been it, it, it's not intentional a lot of well-meaning people have worked very very hard but we know the quality and the customer service isn't where it needs to be and we also know the costs uh, haven't delivered as well and so we made that uh, we've had very frank conversations with our new chancellor about where we wanted um, this where, where we wanted that to go we do know and and again I'll tell you that from coming from the private sector we've done really hard whether it's an IT project and you know my former employer uh, reservation system has been all over the news this week an eight-year 500 million dollar project that's having lots of problems so this is some of the the uh, lack of success or uh, you know, going back a little bit, it's not unusual even in the private sector. So um, you learn along the way and uh, you learn to be better at managing projects, defining requirements, making sure you have subject matter experts, which are, include you in the room who are users of the system. Those are the things that I know the chancellor and everybody's looking at. And you know, there were probably decisions that were made on what should move that 
are going to change. And so be patient. There is definitely a, um, everybody's working very hard um, to make it, to, to get the service that you need and the quality that you need. And, um, and, and we're very well uh, aware of how important it is that that needs to be successful because, again, it goes back to the mission of supporting our universities. Well, I loved hearing both of those because, you know, from our perspective, better services equals opportunities for us to do better with our students. Um, and that's what we're here for. But it also means uh, potentially releasing capital back to the campuses that we can reinvest Absolutely. in our growth and in the programs that we use to serve our students and to, to improve. And it actually, despite some state government's <laughs> belief that we can offer better and better services on less and less money. Money really matters. Um, so that's, it's great hearing from both of you on that topic. It does, and, I, and I, should, I should elaborate just a little, I was just thinking of something too, because I think everybody, it, it was, it's across the board, by the way. When you look at a service, sometimes, sometimes, so we're looking at all sides of that service, right? So what, what we showed the board in November too, um, and we talked about the goals, for both best place to work and also for um, efficient and effective you know, system. Each of the presidents had things around efficient and effective system because the system can even be things that aren't really shared services, but, but they're shared across that individual university, if that makes sense. And so the point is each president agreed there are things they could work on that are across there that could improve as well. So I want to be clear that it is not just one place or the other. We're looking at all of those, and the presidents also have focus and goals. And, are, and are, like I said, we're all, this is all of our shared services. So everybody realizes we play a role in really improving and, and moving forward with those. So, um, so I just wanted to say that wasn't, wanted to make sure there's, there's opportunities in multiple places around that to, to really improve. Right, and process improvement, something we've talked about a lot over the past year and a half uh, here, and we've been doing over the past four years. And I'll just say, uh, it, it'll never stop uh, because we can always get better. But we certainly recognize that here, uh, some of the things and services that we offer, whether they're in collaboration with system or shared services or they're done all by ourselves, need to get better. Uh, and what, what I want to express to everyone in the audience is that there's, there has to be a spirit of openness and non-defensiveness about how we do that. We have to be open to criticism. We have to know when things aren't going well. We have to have specific examples for how we can uh, understand the gaps in service delivery or efficiency so that we can break that down and do it better. Uh, and then get feedback from you to see if it's actually better. Yeah, and I think exactly. that's, the presidents believe that. I know Bob Brown, our CFO, and, and each of the vice presidents believes we can do better. And I know the board and, and, and our chancellor believe we can do better. And I think that's a signal change because not every system can be non-defensive. It's a very hard thing to do. So I, I think that's maybe one of the most hopeful things that I see. Okay, the big moment. Uh, we have people with microphones. Um, Megan in the back, you want to come forward, and Loria, you want to come forward so people can see you. Uh, what I'd like to ask is for your questions, and hopefully there'll be questions and not rants, um, uh, or your solicitation for comments from uh, any of us, actually, on things you believe we need to do better or could do better, or questions about how we improve shared services so that we can support our mission better. And so let's let the games begin. Oh, come on, don't be shy. <laughs> You're not shy with me. <laughs> my name is uh, and, and do introduce yourself. Right, my, my name is Barbara Bush, and I'm representing the Faculty Senate in some ways. I have a question that has something to do with our becoming one of the best places to work. And it's from a faculty perspective. Um, the Faculty Senate um, represents the faculty, as, as we will, uh, try to do the best of our ability. And we'd just like to know what your view is 
On the faculty role, we've talked about teaching, research, scholarly activity, creative activity, and, and service, but the faculty role in the governance process in terms of not only campuses, but also system-wide. Yeah, so, so and, I, and again, like I, like I said, I'm still working on the governance process and how to, how, how to best kind of get, get that feedback in and have it playing out. So, so um, I probably am gonna be reaching out as to, to the faculty senate for input on that and how, to, how, how, how should that feed in? Because I, I can tell you governance is still one that I'm, um, we just had a session. We, Bob Brown and I learned all kinds of different things in that <laughs> session around governance and the breakdown of that. So the point is I think it can definitely be simplified but, but we have to figure out the right ways that those voices come into that and how does that work, right? So how does the faculty voice get in there so that we know, you know, we, we know that we, we are improving from a governance standpoint. Um, but there's a whole lot around best place to work that probably, and, we, and probably get more into that a little bit, a little yeah. bit about engagement and We're gonna and those focus kind of on things. that in about in a, in a bit. minutes or so. Yeah. But, uh, but from, a, from a customer service standpoint, shared service, we do need that voice, and I gotta figure out the right way to plug that in so that, you know, your, your voice is being heard. Right, so, and I might could use some, like I said, I could use some help on that, so. And, and I might add, um, you know, Barbara and the Faculty Senate are, I believe, really good partners. Uh, we have a lot of communication internally in the campus, but I think there's never really been a role or a seat at the table for them on anything broad, more broadly than that. Yet, uh, faculty represent, you know, people who have often primary contact with our students and are uh, empowered uh, with mentoring and shepherding them along. But I want to mention that we also have a staff senate. Uh, and it's important that the staff senate, who are in many cases operationally critical uh, and play <coughs> important roles in the supply chain of service delivery to our students, uh, could be involved. So I, I'll say I, I want to advocate really for point. both groups. Yeah, really good point. <coughs> um, and, and by the way, uh, Anybody, any of us might answer a question, but if someone else wants to jump in, just go ahead and chime in. Yeah, no, I just say when we get to best place to work, I'll, I'll throw in the faculty side with some. Other questions about shared services, comments, things that you want to see us work on? Oh, come on, don't make me go to my list. <laughs> Good afternoon, Hello. Chancellor, Regent, President Smatras. Dave Reynolds with Facilities. Um, more of an example of how shared service can work well. I think we can all come up with examples of how we've had struggles, but one of the things we saw in the last year that worked well, maybe didn't start down the, the good path, but was with the rollout of e-leave. Um, as the university and the system got ready to roll out e-leave, we in Facilities became aware of it, reached out to Abdul Muhammad, uh, Aaron LeMay, expressed some concerns with some things we heard and they embraced us came in and we were ex able to explain to them that there are certain power users out there that might be a good test bed before you go university-wide for instance we've got diverse workforce standard eight hour a day five day a week folks but also some days on you know some folks on 10 hours a day custodians in the middle of the night people who literally barely know how to use a computer, and I'm not kidding, I mean, we have to teach them how to use the mouse, right click, left click. They can tear up an Apple iPhone, but you know, the right click, left click thing kind of threw them. And so uh, the team actually worked with us very well to kind of use us as a test bed, and I think that was a good example of before rolling out a broad scale program, find some power users out there across the universities that you may be able to, to practice with, and we're always willing to be that, that guinea pig and test, test bed. Yeah, I think one of the challenges we've had over the past few years is that often something just happened, and we were left post hoc, training, catching up, figuring out, interpreting, filling in the gaps, and so where we, where we can go through an iteration, you know, in a, in a, in a area like David just discussed, uh, where we get really good user input, uh, we tend to have a smoother rollout. 
No, I, th I think that's an excellent, yeah. an excellent view, an excellent idea. Um, I find it interesting only because in my first week here, um, I, 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 I typically do something I call, um, so, so everybody knows about exit interviews and um, typically people will do an exit interview. Well, that's kind of late. <laughs> Somebody's leaving at that point. Um, probably I, I call something called a stay interview. Um, where you really talk to people regularly about um, what, what makes you come to work, what, what, what do you have passion around, what do you get excited about, you know, and, and what makes you hit the snooze button, right? So in, in, so in that, you can kind of get what, and it kind of gets into engagement and get, you know, wh why people come to work. But, but in my first week, I asked some folks about uh, that, and, and Ely was defined as one of the reasons they hit the snooze button. It was driving them crazy. Right, so I think that's interesting how you say it was. A, so uh, it you've, it worked well from your perspective. Others were kind of frustrated by it, but I think about the lack of understanding and some things around that. So um, I know Aaron Lemay heard some of that, uh, took some lessons learned from that going forward. That even because I think with you know best intentions, usually everything's best intentions. So we will think through some of these things before you roll out a system and implications of that and. And uh, some things are we're going to learn from, and then we'll course correct, right? So it's we're not going to perfectly do it every time, and all we can say is we're going to learn and improve the way we're doing it. And um, so I think that's that's really important. Yeah, and, I, and, and shared ser services is not a new concept, and I kind of even hate to use the word, but there is such an opportunity if we do things correctly and well with customer service. It'll make your life so much easier, and it's so much, it's so efficient. It's it's this isn't rocket science. We're not the first one to do it. I know there were some questions about well, our campuses are different. It's not the same. Uh, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a board of a multinational company that's you know all over the globe, and they have shared services. They have different languages. They have so again, it can work, but it has to be done right. The customers have to be involved, and so um, be patient, but also be helpful. You know, and uh, if you see. If you have idea, and I'll tell you what we always found is when we went through and wanted to change and improve processes, the best ideas always came from our own employees. It wasn't consultants. Y'all see oh, yeah. the inefficiency and you see waste, and you guys can be so helpful. And you know, if you did it this way, um, so so uh, instead of wine, and I'm not, I'm really not trying to lecture. Um, try to help be part of the the solution um, because in the end, if we can make some of this, when we make some of this stuff, not if. When, when we make this stuff better, I think you will find your life is so much easier and you could spend your time on things that are so much more rewarding and aimed at um, really um, our core missions. Core that, mission here, so. That's exactly why I've approached kind of the, the services the way I have, where it's us in the rhyme. No consultants are in here. It's us. Like I said, it's wearing Bob Brown out, but it's us, and we are rolling up our sleeves. It's me. I'm in every single one of these, right, where we're um, talking through under, you know, kind of this general statement about something. I, I was, HR is broken. I can't do much about that. I've got to break that down into, okay, what's not working? And so that's what we've been doing is really dissecting, breaking it down. And in that, which, which things are... There's usually levels of importance, right? Onboarding and being able to get key people on board is pretty is pretty important, right? So so that's what we're trying to do in all of this is really it's us and and getting us being members of all people to try to get a good view of that and uh, and then starting to figure out how to move ahead. So that's that's exactly and and getting good ideas on the things that we ought to b improve. Uh, you're right, they're coming from within, and, uh, and we need more of those, you know, too, as we go forward. So. Are there, there must be more questions. <laughs> Anybody else? We have, we have a couple. And back there, Wes. So, not about shared services. So there's a, we're having a lot of discussion amongst faculty and staff on, re, on retention and marketable skill sets for our students. Can we get your thoughts as a chancellor, as a regent, on what are you thinking about with regard to retention? And I know that's implied in enrollment and graduation. 
and then your thoughts on marketable skill sets. So on, so on retention, I think, um, I mean, I, I think President Spahn- Retention's was, good. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> excellent. I'm, I'm all for retention. But, um, but, but I mean, the point is, I think there's a lot of great things that you're putting in place around student advisement and trying to really to, to help, you know, with keeping that, with, with also, um, you know, kind of those key internship programs and those kind of things, the corporate engagements that's helping to keep students, well, that was the other piece, right? So, so both of those things are all, you know, it's just a lot of really good things. The advisement piece, I think, being really, really essential um, from a retention standpoint. I, I would say retention and marketable skills are things that the regents and the chancellor should be interested in uh, because they're part of our goals and our metrics and they're part of our mission, yeah, but they're, they're really right. university-based uh, challenges. So, uh, look, if you talk to Shannon, who's on the recruitment end, there's no point to have intake uh, and fill the bucket full of water if you got a lot of leaks, because uh, then you're not being very efficient. That's true. We've got to we've got to fix the leaks. Uh, we have done better, generally, uh, over the past few years. Retention's improved, uptick to, in most areas, about a point or so a year. In some areas, we've made some really big jumps in terms of uh, graduation rates. So we went from like 30 to 30. 6% or 31 to 37% in four-year graduation rate in one year uh, as a result of a lot of things coming together. But here's our challenge in retention. Um, I'm gonna look over at folks like Michael Montesino and others. Um, we, we need more and better data. Retention's tricky, it's not one thing. If there was one button I could push, I'd be up here pushing it real hard right now. It's a host of nested issues. It has to do with engagement. It has to do with uh, students' individual situations. It has to do with academic success and qualifications. It has to do with a whole <coughs> bunch of issues that we have no control over, uh, familial issues, commuting. I mean, all kinds of things fall into it. What we don't have, but there's a growing database on a national level of is what the breakdown of those are and then how personalized analytics and things like predictive analytics can help us to intervene with supportive advising and counseling and when, when it's needed. And that's a goal of ours. I, 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 and if you get me wound up on the IT data predictive analytics piece, then we'll kill the rest of this session. All I can say is we are having just installed a really good database that's got the architecture we now need to begin big data and predictive analytics and personalized analytics. I think we're on the cusp of being able to uh, start to address these issues. Um, the first part's knowing what to do, and the second part is having enough money to do it. And of course, I look to the right and I look to the left uh, with my colleagues up here saying if we can get shared services improved and if we can get some dollars returned to the campus, then we can deliver more on the promise of those kinds of things. Marketable skills, how, how much have we been talking about the relationship between Texas, employers' needs, the new economy, internships, career awareness, uh, and creating an ecosystem where we're able to be nimble enough to make sure that the degrees that we're putting out have relevance in the marketplace and that the students have the base education and skills to have uh, a robust, full career lifetime. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, we need a suite of great skills that are the kinds of core things you'll hear about uh, in a liberal education. On the other hand, we know that companies are saying, we don't even care if you have a college degree, if you have this X, Y, Z in IT, we're gonna hire you right now today. Uh, we've gotta thread that needle ourselves. And that means we've gotta come together, be collaborative, and work with effectiveness to create degree programs that speak to the market. And what the, the key to that for me right now is we're listening to employers. And I think there's almost nothing more important than gathering that up. 
not just in the trivial way where the CEO says, oh, they need to write better and we need to know how to send an email, but in deeper ways where we're really looking at what their companies need and how people advance and evolve through the corporate structures. So uh, you're going to hear me talk a lot about our partnerships with businesses over the next year. We've already started Dallas Cowboys, Toyota, Fidelity, uh, Net Dragon, and there's a whole bunch of others. The next phase of that is already occurring where we're talking about internships with them and what they need. And the next phase from there is how does that feed back and inform us for positive curricular change. And the provost is going to be squarely on point with these issues, working with the colleges and the departments to make sure we're being effective. And I'm sorry that was long-winded, but you just happened to hit a pet topic. <laughs> That's a good, yeah. So I'll be pretty short and sweet because the um, president did such an amazing job. But, but yeah, from a region perspective, we talk about the campus and students. That's what, what, what matters. But the student comes here and they don't graduate. We haven't been very successful. I mean, and as a parent with two college graduates, um, uh, it's very important to me, and, and we all know that, you know, there's so many disruptors out there, and higher ed is not immune from that. There is a lot of concern about the cost of education and the value, particularly when students come out with the student debt load that they're, you know, going to be paying off for the rest of their life. So, yeah, we care a lot about, um, and we do, we look at the, uh, how long it takes to graduate, again, and it's important that we have that we're doing things to try to improve that, the things that, that Neil talked about. That's, again, where we'd rather have the campuses spend their time than processing payroll or, you know, or, or whatever. It's that, that's what really matters. And then on the, and then on the uh, curriculum side, I've been very pleased to see what we've done and what we've approved in the last couple of years. And, you know, I, I, I read the Dallas Morning News every day when I'm in town. And, uh, and you know, I was talking to Rand earlier, we're getting in the news all the time. There was an article about our new uh, uh, merchandising. Consumer experience. Consumer merchandising. It, w it made the morning news, but w in the data yeah. analytics, those are important that we're thinking back and, and saying, we can't just offer all those traditional degree plans. Uh, we need to make sure that we're off, because the jobs are different today. They're different than they were when I got out, and they're gonna continue to change. So again, with the provost and and um, President, we, we've got to stay focused on, and, and if we do all that, students are going to want to come here, their parents are going to want them to come here, because as a parent, mm -hmm. you want to send your child somewhere where they're going to be equipped to, uh, to be able to support themselves and succeed in life. That's what, we, that's what we need to, that's what we have to do. Are there other questions about shared services efficiencies? I, I've got a couple I can throw out if no one else has any, but oh, okay. It's coming. It's starting to grow. Um, Catherine Gould Colvin, am I on? I You're so. on, Kathy. Catherine Gould Colvin, College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. Um, the people in the room who know me know I'm never short of opinions. <laughs> and I would give you suggestions on how to improve shared services, except I don't know what to do about it. And that's because I see things and I'm told things but I don't know what the underlying issue is. I could probably make you a list of underlying issues, but I don't know what the underlying issue really is. So I can't make any specific suggestions. I would say simply thinking about moving anything back to the campuses is not necessarily the solution. That's true. And people who've been here as long as I do will remember that one of the functions that's now in shared services used to be on our campus. And we hired those people, Denton hired those people, Denton trained them, Denton paid them. And for years, everyone on campus complained about how poor their customer service was and no one could figure out how to fix it. So simply moving it back doesn't fix it either. You've got to address the underlying questions. So I hope when you put your little user groups or focus groups together that they will get to the core of the issue. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Me too, uh, that, that will be the plan. Um, Maybe, we, maybe we should talk about what, you know, you and I can get together and talk some, what the, some of the issues that you saw. So, see, you got an action out of that. Yeah. We, no, but it'd be, it'd be really good. An I action item that we've r repeatedly asked for, and, and Catherine and others can tell you, we hosted some pretty straightforward meetings around financial transformation. And 
what I said was, don't tell me the system sucks. You know, what you need to tell me is, I tried to do this kind of a transaction and it was either really hard or I didn't understand it or it didn't go through so that we can break it down and then to begin to address it and using kind of a systems approach. Yeah. Um, and that's what I want to ask everyone in this audience to try to do. Tell us what the problem you encountered was, be as specific as you can. We understand that we may have to generalize that problem, you know, but by giving us the specifics, we can all work better. Like, is it an input problem that the campus is having? Is it a processing IT issue? Is it it's the balls being dropped because there's no communication across this particular boundary? You know, those are very complicated things that need something like our Toyota Lean Process people working on uh, because they make us go through all the steps to understand where the gaps might, might occur. And, and I think it's been hard to do that and I think it's going to get easier to do that because really this communication between system and the campuses was pretty hostile, uh, to be blunt. Um, everybody, you know, it was, everybody pointed fingers as opposed to trying to solve the problem. We need to solve the problem. Yep. I agree. Uh, okay, I'm going to call this last call for questions. I might ask one or two off the list otherwise. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to give you one that uh, is oh, one of my personal favorites. <laughs> um, oh, no. and, it, and it has to do with, uh, at the end of the evaluation, do you anticipate there will be a reduction in shared service costs to the campus? Um, I think we need to move to best place to work. So that's <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am absolutely, I absolutely do. Um, I think we're already seeing efficiencies in what we've been working through. Um, we've already found some opportunities there. Um, and by the way, some of that is in priorities, right? I, again, it, this is not about, and I, I think Regent Wright pointed that out, this is not about people not doing the very best jobs they can do, right? I think everybody is trying to do those. It's just some of those things we might not need. They might not be our priority, right? So I want to be clear about that. This isn't about the people as much as it is about what is it we really need for our services to be and make sure that they're performing where we need them to be. So, so yes, I do see some cost efficiencies already uh, in some of the things that we've been looking at and proposing. Um, and I found some in inefficiencies in how I think things are. And so we're going to be, you know, kind of folk moving, on, moving on those. All right, and I'm not going to um, repeat qu asking questions about HR. I, I want to add a little exclamation point that, that was the most frequently asked question. Uh, and I think there's a general awareness of that, and I have a feeling that our uh, chancellor and cabinet and others, uh, president's council, will be um, working that issue very hard. Oh yeah, as, as I said, that, that that that's popping as probably probably one that, uh, probably the top priority. I would think of the things that we're coming out of, um, and we're and and so we're we're very much focused on that one. Th there was one about phone numbers. I know it may sound wildly trivial. But I think it's a, an example of communication. So yeah. let me give you an impression I had. When I got here, um, in order to get a problem solved, someone like Ruby in my office would know who to call. And if you had a long-standing administrative assistant, you could get stuff done. <laughs> That's true. Phone would get picked up, someone would get talked to, problem solved. If you had a brand new administrative assistant who didn't know who to pick up the phone to call, God help you. <laughs> because you could have a problem for a really long time until that person <laughs> called the AA down the hall who said, oh, here's who you call. By, we, that, by we, the way, that's consistent in NASA. <laughs> I imagine, I bet in Southwest. <laughs> Look, the, the world runs by administrative assistants who know who to call. Now, the, the problem here is that if you have a problem and you go through channels, you call 5500, 5500. 
you then get sent on a circuitous path <laughs> that may or may not lead you to the place you need to go, to the promised land. I actually think a huge number of the problems that we face could be solved by having better direct communication between customer and service. How many of you have called your TV company or your cable company and gotten into the infinite phone tree <laughs> with three wrong misdirected calls of people telling you we don't fix it there? And by the end, did you want to strangle them through the phone? I mean, no. so the question here is, can we find out who is the best person to call so that we don't have to go through the wrong stuff and we have better direct communication so that we can get to the, where we can solve a problem when we do have a problem? And, that, and, and I know that I mean, you can answer sure, but. No, no, we are all, that is, that is definitely on the list. Yeah. Okay. That Great. is one of the, the list items. The person who wrote this, and it was not me, because I've got Ruby, but the, per, the person who wrote this will be very gratified by that answer. Um, all right. Uh, with that, uh, we would like to move along now to uh, part B of this conversation, which is about trying, uh, understanding how we can do better by, with creating a place that you feel is a great place to work. And we recognize, I, I, I think, that there's a lot of things we do to try to celebrate our employees, whether it's staff sat lunches or faculty senate interactions or whether it's awards ceremonies that we give out and recognitions. But at the end of the day, when you come into work every day, it's your colleagues, your supervisor, um, and the work environment that you're presented with that, uh, and, and the services and care you receive, the communications that you get, that really determine uh, whether you like your job or not and if you're a great place to work. So uh, I think recognizing that, uh, we've got some folks up here who have been involved in very big, complicated organizations where there certainly are probably every flavor of employee challenge or opportunity to create a great place to work. Uh, and I would love to get a sense uh, from uh, our guests on what workplace engagement means to them. And so I'm going to open up uh, a question both to Lisa and Laura on what does workplace engagement and um, mean to you? And let's collapse that a little with and what made working at NASA or working with Southwest Airlines when it, when it was good what made it a great place to work? Why don't we start with Laura? Okay, sure. So this is my passion point, my hot button, so I'll, I'll try not to, uh, to, to spend too much time. So, so first of all, you know, what is workplace engagement? You know, when I started working at Southwest over 30 years ago, um, we didn't talk about best place to work or workplace engagement. They weren't even, you know, they weren't even talked about. And, um, but I, again, it was one of those lucky points in my life where I, I um, took that risky opportunity and um, we, were, we were really trendsetters in that area. We didn't know we were and, and I'll kind of talk to you a little bit about why, but let me first talk about what I think workplace engagement is. I think it's um, having an environment where employees um, understand and they, they basically are supportive and committed to their organization's goals and um, mission and they truly, they come to work every day thinking that they're going to make a difference and help their company or their organization achieve those goals. I mean, that, that's really what an engaged workforce is. It's people that think it's their company and they truly want their organization to be successful and they're proud to work there. And so, um, and we can talk about, I'll, and, and I'll talk about why I think that's it's kind of obvious why it's important. I mean, um, if you look at any research that's done, um, organizations that ha have engaged workforces are always more successful than organizations that aren't. And then on the other side, the employees that are engaged are happier, they have higher self-esteem, 
and uh, they're just more satisfied. I mean, so what a win-win situation. You know, why would you, why would any organization not want that? Because um, people are your key to success. And so, to me, it's just so basic why you would want to have an engaged workforce. And I can tell you, if, if you look across the private sector, every company I'm associated with, it is a strategic goal, is to be a best place to work. And best place to work doesn't necessarily mean Dallas Morning News ranked you in the top whatever. It's, it's your DNA, it's your culture. And, and, and it's being in a place where you, you work as a team. You know, you get rid of those silos and everybody works towards the same goals. And I can give you some examples. Um, but, but when I think about how did we get that at Southwest before people even talked about it, it was kind of out of necessity. We were, we were underdogs and in our early days, um, nobody thought our organization would survive. You know, we had some big airlines that were doing their best to make sure that we went out of business. And really, it, it's pretty miraculous that we did, that we, that we, uh, that we made it. But um, when you're fighting for survival, the employees understood the importance and they worked together and they were committed to that organization. Gave great customer service, went above and beyond. And so we really, we were fortunate. We had that culture um, along the way, and it, we were under attack for a long time. So it was, it was incredible. And you guys are you guys are in the higher ed setting, so you you guys know how many business case studies have been done. Not just business case. You see it in hospitality. You see it in so many different schools that talk about that culture at Southwest Airlines and and the things um, that we did. But um, it was um, you know it was just an incredible experience to be part of that early on and to see how other companies have embraced that and um, how important that is. And I'll, I'll wait till we come back to it and I'll give you some examples after, after Lisa. Talks. Yeah, so, so best place to work, so NASA was best place to work six years in the row in the federal government, has been, and, um, and, uh, and so it's not, it's critical why I think, you know, what, why is engagement important, why is best place to work important. Um, it's really about uh, engaging employees and what, what that means to me is really about, and, and, and Regent Wright really stated it, it's around um, employees that are engaged in the mission, care about the mission, happy to come to work there, right? They, they, want, they understand their role in that mission. Um, it's an environment where leaders are leading and they're focused on developing employees. Um, they're focusing on succession. The succession port plan is important because you want that organization to be successful in the future. Um, it's uh, an, um, uh, where leaders know they need to create an environment where innovation, for, for innovation, for, for a, a place like NASA to be successful, you have to have that. It's a team environment where everybody values each other's role. Um, you don't do a mission to Mars or the kind of tough missions that occur there without everybody getting that everybody has a critical role to play and you need to value those roles. And any break in that link can destroy a mission. And so it's everybody pitching together, being a part of that team and being excited about that team. And, and so I think that's really what I, what, why it's so important is, is it's a high performing org. And, and, and that's what we want to be, right? So that's why being a best place to work is important to me because, because we're all going to be happier as part of that, right? And we're all going to be producing more as part of that because we, we love what we, we get what we're doing, we love what we're doing, and we're all wanting to be successful um, as a whole. So I think that's kind of a simple way of saying, you know, a talk about why I think it's so important to be a best place to work. So Neil, can I, was, I, I shared an example this morning. It's, it's not the, one of the most, there's a lot of fun, exciting stories about Southwest, and this may not fit in that category, but I think it's one of those, maybe Barbara even kind of brings in the, you know, the faculty, all the different roles, but um, you know, as, as I was looking at the questions, thinking about some experiences, I could, you know, a thousand, you know, and how do you, how do you pick one? But we had um, a time, this was, I, I think it was in the mid-90s, and, um, those of you who are, you know, in, in those of us on the stage age group, remember a point in time when you uh, bought air travel, most people went through a travel agent. You didn't have a, you didn't have the internet. You couldn't go online and, and buy your tickets. But, and even then when you traveled, 
you had like this stack, this ticket, this paper, there's like six pieces of, you know, all stapled together, but you had, to, you couldn't travel if you didn't have that physical ticket with you. They wouldn't let you on the plane. So at that time, the travel agent community, um, they used these automated reservation systems. That's what they needed to book tickets for their customers and print those tickets. And at that point in time, those um, big, they're called GDS systems, were owned by the big airlines. So American Airlines owned one, uh, United owned one, Eastern, those of you who remember them, they, they owned the, those, um, and so they kind of got together, and at that point in time, we had become successful, and we were kind of a thorn in their side. And they really didn't like us because our costs were so much lower, we could price our fares below their costs. So they decided to um, remove our inventory from their reservation systems, which meant that the travel agent community, and for us at that time, that was 50% of our sales. So 5-0, think of if you're, what would happen if your enrollment dropped by yeah, that'd 50%, be bad. it would be a crisis, and uh, <laughs> it was a crisis. And so we, we were like, what are we gonna do? And you know, so we, we had our own reservation systems and agents, and we knew that we could get out to the travel agent community and they could call in, still not as convenient, but they could call and make a reservation, but they still didn't have the ability to deliver that piece of paper that their customer had to have to fly. And so we created a department, a new department. It was in, in my organization in finance. I wasn't CFO at the time, I was younger then. And we called it our ticket by mail, but we created this system where the travel agents would um, call the reservations, we'd go into a special queue, we printed them all there, and they all had to go out in individual Federal Express envelopes that night. You know, tens of thousands of, um, of these tickets that had to be mailed. Well, we didn't have the staff or the infrastructure to do that. So literally, we had employees from across the system, pilots who didn't normally come into the office on their days off. Uh, everybody came in and volunteered to help and stuff those Federal Express envelopes every night you know, to, so we could keep the operation going. So again, it's one of those where people under, understood the they wanted the company to be successful, they understood the, the goals, and it, it didn't matter whether it was their job or not, they were gonna get in there to pitch in. So I think that just gives you an example of when you have an engaged um, environment, how, how people think. And it's not just about, you know, it's not just, and it was rewarding, they were thrilled that they helped the company succeed. Now, in the end, it ended up being a pretty great story because when that happened, it was like, wow, this, this, this is serious. Why do, why do people have to have this six thing piece of paper to travel? You know, you don't have to have that when you check into a hotel, so we created Ticketless Travel, first airline in the world to do that. Do you know what that did to our cost structure when we got rid of all that paper? And then the second thing it did was as the internet came along, we created Southwest.com, which was the first airline website, which now is 95% of all the sales. So again, 10% travel agency commission. So huge, so it, it really led to innovation, but it wasn't one person. It was ideas from our employees about how can we, how can we prevent this problem again? What can we do to, to be better? And those solutions ended up, you know, vaulting us into a far superior customer product than we had before. So again, it's just an example of, of everybody working together and being proud of the organization they work for and, and wanting it, it to be successful. So anyway. Well, it, it actually says I'm supposed to ask myself this question. Yep. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking out at Bob and at Shannon, <coughs> and I'm just thinking about some of the experiences we've been through here. But I, I think my answer is utterly parallel to the answers you both gave. Um, and I'll say it as simply as I can. Uh, I feel like the luckiest person in the world to have this job. Um, we get to change people's lives. We get to make the world a better place. We get to discover things no one ever thought about and try to make those translated into benefits for the society and the world around us. When I'm having a really bad day, a really bad day, which probably means I have meetings about things that make my head hurt. Um, I will walk outside and I'll sit down on a bench and I'll start talking with a student. And it fixes me up. Because 
talking to the students reminds me about why I'm here, reminds me about their hopes and dreams, and makes me feel good about whatever it is, centers me, and allows me to go back and deal with whatever ridiculous situation might have occurred. So why am I here? I'm here for the students. I'm here for the simple joy of seeing them achieve at a high level. Our mission is to give our students the skills and the knowledge and the training to have successful careers and to be satisfied citizens and to make this state and the world around us a better place. Now, if you don't like that mission, <laughs> you shouldn't be here. And I'm not saying that in a mean-spirited no, way, absolutely. but it's what we do. And it feels to me like liking that mission is as easy as falling off a log. Mm. But sometimes you can forget it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes day-to-day -day things come to the fore, and that can make you less engaged. So the first thing I want to say is, we all need to remember what we're here for. And, and, and I almost want to say a little revelation I had while you were talking is if each of you who is having any type of a, a challenge or a tough day could go out and talk to a student, I think it'd square you away and remind you how wonderful it is that we get to work in this place. So I too feel we're mission driven. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's in my heart to do that. Um, and when we hire employees, we want to hire employees who have it in their hearts to do it. Now, that doesn't mean you'd have to get up in the morning and immediately worry about how your students are doing. It might be, you know, you're doing your research and your students will share in your research and the world will share in your research and that, can, that also can be a great passionate driver. But that's, that's what I think binds us and unites us. So if you're a leader or if you're embedded in a group, hopefully we make you feel like a team member who's contributing to that goal. Hopefully you get linked to it. Now, I can understand if I'm in housekeeping that that might not be the first thing out of a supervisor's mouth. But maybe we need to figure out a way to help it be the first thing out of a supervisor's mouth. And, and that's possibly challenging. But again, I, I, I think that will help us all. So I think really believing in our mission, in reminding ourselves of it, in helping the different work groups feel like they're valuable members of the team contributing to it is a great thing. Now, the anecdote part. I look at Bob and I look at Shannon and, and, and every, many of in the room shared this. Um, we've had our share of challenges. One great way to build a team is when you're challenged. And you just said that. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's when you're together. bound together by something so much bigger than you are, something that could be an existential threat. And so Bob knows uh, when we got here, Bob wasn't here immediately, but um, lots of stuff had to happen quickly. And I was without a CFO for a little while. Uh, Bob stepped in. And Bob, you'd have to probably say there was a war room mentality. We'd come in just about every other day. We'd be at the whiteboard. We'd be measuring the, the dollars. We'd be seeing where things went. And that had a great effect of pulling a team together. And uh, a number of people were here in the room at the time. And um, I just want to say uh, that builds a team. And it makes you think out of the box. And it makes you realize you got to do things differently. And so uh, threats are a great driver of progress and change. Um, the other thing, uh, Shannon uh, came to me. And Shannon came in um, to help you know, build our enrollment uh, and, and recruiting and admissions apparatus. And um, 
when, when we got here, we were having some challenges with processing FAFSA forms, I guess it was. Uh, it was taking maybe six to eight weeks, and, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, I don't ever want to blame the people who are sitting there trying to process a FAFSA, for, FAFSA form, and if you've ever tried to process a form like that, you'll know it's not necessarily the most gratifying single activity of the world. Um, you know, taking six to eight weeks, well, what was happening to recruitment? Well, schools that took a few days to process were getting offers out and getting acceptances back, and so Shannon's group uh, faced a threat. Uh, and basically, Shannon said, we're gonna get her done. And we knew that there were better and smoother paths that would utilize newer technologies that would get us through it. But Shannon, what'd you have to do initially? Everybody rolled up their shirts like, how many, how many extra hours did everyone have to work? But you know what? They got it done. They got it down from six to eight weeks to five days just off sheer brute force hard work. And that's, when that happens, you know you've got a team of committed people who care. And I, and I hate to say a stress test is great, but we all encounter challenges in the workplace. Challenges are opportunities. They're opportunities to improve. And so I hope that we work together through all levels of our organization to make sure that when it gets down to the functional units where there's people who are doing the job and people who are supervising them, we all remember that we can take our challenges, work as a team, do better, perform at a higher level, become a high-performing group, and, and, and enjoy the benefits that that brings to you both personally in your satisfaction and in your happiness to be part of a workplace and to be engaged. So there's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, and that's how I feel. But I think we've got a ways to go. And I think there, we can communicate our values better down into our organization to make sure that people get that sense of worth and participation in the team. So that's what I hope we're able to do. And that's what a change I think we're dedicated to bring. Um, now what's the narrator supposed to do? Oh, um, we, we have some more questions here, but I think time is starting to get a little thin, like maybe we're almost up. Uh, so why don't we just turn to the audience for a few questions to, uh, or comments on how they feel we can do better to create a great place to work and uh, specifically things that you feel we can do. And by the way, I, I'm also blessed to have what I consider to be the best leadership team I've ever worked with in my life. Um, I want to go to work and like my workplace. I want to go to work and work with people who I think are working hard to get things done uh, and working together every day to get it done. Uh, I got a great team. I'm really lucky. If you're, uh, my team is a series of team leaders and I hope you all feel like you have great teams. And, and I'll say if you don't, then, then you gotta figure out what it's gonna take to give you that team because this has to penetrate the entire organization. So, I saw people with questions. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's hear from them. Um, you know, we know culture trumps all of our goals. And we know that both at Southwest and NASA, it was very clear what your, what, what your mission was, who your customer was in the case of Southwest, and everyone could easily get focused on that. That's not really the case here. So just take the example of retention, because I'm, I'm a chair, so I really see how that works. My faculty have no incentive. I can tell them that retention matters to the bureaucracy, but they have no real incentive. Everything that incents them, all their reward system, promotion, tenure, how they get raises, and everything else is based on their individual performance. And actually, if they drive the poor students that need more help, out of their classroom, it doesn't even count against them the way we do the spot test. So we have to take a good look at the incentives because there's no real incentive for them to care about the whole. It's easy when you were at Southwest to care about the whole because it, it was what the whole place was about. And at NASA, it was real clear what your mission was. Get them up there and bring them back safely. But we don't have that here that gets down to where the rubber really meets the road to our ultimate customer, which is the students and the people who hire them. 
there's no incentive for the faculty to actually care. Yeah, a lot of them do, don't get me wrong. I have great faculty. But I have faculty that don't care and it's obvious they don't care because they're not rewarded to care. So, so this is huge. This is the real culture that fights all those great objectives we have for the whole because they're not really part of the whole because the rewards don't really match up to that. And it, it probably goes on in a lot of the stovepipes too. But you know, I, I know it from the faculty having been one for almost 30 years here. So uh, it, it's more a challenge than a criticism, but this is something that really needs to be considered. Yeah, I, I'm gonna jump right in and really respond strongly to that. First, I believe that the vast majority of our faculty really do care. Um, maybe I'm a Pollyanna. And I understand that it's easier to pay attention to faculty members who don't care, who are disruptive, not in the positive method of disruption. I understand that there are folks who've burned out and that they're protected by tenure. I understand all those things. I was a faculty member. Um, I also understand that as a faculty member, I had colleagues who really cared if their leadership help focus them on the issue. Now I understand that chairs revolve, and that chairs are also tasked with a lot of challenges. But when a chair can build a team that believes in their mission, whether it's teaching applied anthropology, or astrobiology, or whatever it might be, um, I believe that that chair pulls people together and helps them to achieve at a high level. I happen to be a firm believer that the critical component in the educational part, and I'm not talking about the other support missions that the other vice presidential areas carry out, our chairs. And I think that we haven't always given our chairs all the tools and all the communication that they might need to help appreciate what we feel are critical objectives or to just sit down and be reflective and contemplative about why faculty are here. And you talk about reward systems. Um, I'm pretty sure when we pay faculty, we're not paying you just to do research. We generally are paying you to do service. We really are paying you to be wonderful educators, which I'm going to take in a much broader context than simply stand and deliver lecturing. So the opportunity to think, am I teaching so that people can learn. Do I have learning outcomes? Is what I'm doing relevant to the world and to the health of our students? Am I nurturing them? Am I a pump or am I a filter? And how I carry that out needs to be something that we promote and encourage at every opportunity. Otherwise, you are right, you'll fall into a series of fragmented, independent interpretations of what it means to be an educator, and you won't have the team spirit to build from. But I'll still say, I've been on a lot of campuses in my life, and I've been a faculty member, a chair, a dean, a provost, a vice chancellor, a president, a president, you know, I've gotten to do a whole lot of different roles on campuses. Of all the campuses I've been on, I still believe that this campus cares more about its students and their education than any place I've been. So when I hear your somewhat pessimistic note about reward, I have to say, if you think it's bad here, it's worse in a lot of other places. But I also have to say, it's still something we should address by helping our dean and chair leaders have the tools they need to engage their faculty and to remind them of what really matters. And maybe what you can do is the next time you have a faculty meeting, and I promise you it'll start with complaining, but that's okay. Complaining step one of getting to a good place is ask them why they're here and why they do this job and why they care and see how that goes. Yes, applause is good. Okay, so, so you brought up an incredibly important point, and I'm not, I didn't just you know, fall off the turnip truck. I, I understand that that occurs, 
but I believe there's ways of reminding people why we're here and what we're here to do and why that makes you feel good inside. So sorry for jumping on that one, but it's definitely hit a hot button for me. Jason. Good afternoon, Jason Simon, Data Analytics Institutional Research. I'm blessed to have a great team. Uh, it's also a multi-generational team, so that's the basis of my question. Freshmen and sophomores that are on our campus now, if, if one of us in this room has them as a work-study student, you're in an environment now where we have four generations in the workplace, all with competing interests, demands, needs, and expectations. And so as we go to build a culture of engagement and excellence, I'm curious to hear your thoughts and perspectives on how there may not be one single silver bullet to do this, given the diversity of employees we have. Yes, yeah, so well, I, I think that's- Wow, that's an awesome question. Yeah, so that's why I think really, you know, it's part of, by the way, the survey is a tool, right? And whether you like the survey or not, it's really a tool to get input and to see where we are. But then it really requires that conversation. And so we need each of our department heads and faculty and all to be having those discussions on what does that really mean? Why do we score the way we scored? And getting all those different perspectives because it's not always multi-generational that it varies. I mean, you can't assume everybody in one generation is actually the same either, quite frankly. So I think it really caused, because when you think about best place to work and the things that get people jazzed and the things that kind of frustrate them, you, should, you need to discuss all of those and then figure out what you can do about those things and how you can address them. So I think it really requires a conversation um, to really understand all of that because I think people are different and it, it isn't always a generational thing. I think people differ, differ from, from... I was just thinking how ironic it was that we were asking this question in a place where we educate 17-year-olds. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we have a gamut. <laughs> we run, even in the people we graduate, from 17 to 70, and I've seen that in a graduation. Uh, you'd think we'd be good at it, but I'm not sure we are. So I think it's a great question that deserves deeper analysis. And you know, I might just give that to our data guys to work on. <laughs> I'll just I'll Wait. just add. Um, <laughs> yeah, I it's called the boomerang effect. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of um, there's no answer to any. There's no specific, you do this, you're a great place to work. Yeah. You have to do a lot of things. Oh, yeah. and, um, and a lot of them are not hard, but it's a combination of things, even on communication. Um, you've got people spread out, people in different roles, different hours. You have to, you have to uh, reach people in 10 different ways because certain, certain employees are gonna get this, certain are this, so there's not a silver bullet. This, if we do this, we have it. It's gotta be, and that's why I think when you get results of a survey and you start addressing, ah, oh, I don't really like how we're scoring here, let's figure out what's going on. I think it takes a team, including leaders, including faculty, including students, get the constituents, have them talk about it. Again, the best idea is what are things we can do to be better? And it's not gonna be one answer. It's gonna be, let's do five or six different things and push these out, and a lot of it's communication, but it's not a, there's not a single, and it's getting more so that way as we're getting, you know, more generations and, and but to Lisa's point, it's, it's not just generational. It's so many factors yeah. uh, that come into place. Uh, and I would say the key is to always come back to hiring people and making sure people are focused on that shared mission and, and goals and objectives that we have. I mean, that's the key. Uh, uh, it occurs to me when I bring folks in, it should be a whole lot less about some personal idiosyncratic goal that they have and much more about are they a fit to the organization. And I think that if we all love the fact that we're here in an educational environment changing students' lives, we'll each find a way to try to contribute. And maybe those ways are gonna be pretty different generationally. But um, still it comes back to we have to have a shared purpose to make a good team. Or maybe you need to fabricate a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, 
we were maybe have that a was a joke. That was a joke. That was a joke. No, I mean that we had that same <laughs> discussion in NASA. We do well in a crisis, so maybe we should always be in a crisis state. Yeah. Uh, more questions about engagement uh, or about what we can do better as a campus to really make people feel good about working here. Yeah, Gary. So my question is, how has, has there been a review or thought of how colleges, schools, and departments engage staff to include those staff members in the strategic, strategic planning of those areas? Um, yeah, yeah so, so to help Laura and, and Lisa, schools really have a little bit of a divide. There's the VP areas that, uh, like enrollment management and student affairs and finance and administration and development, that each have their own stakeholder groups, but that are occupied by staff individuals. And then there's, under the provost leadership, there's faculty and all the colleges. Yet, sometimes we kind of forget that faculty and all the colleges have a whole bunch of staff members working in them. Mm -hmm. And I I'm gonna be the first to say there's a bit of a caste system uh, with faculty in one place and staff in another. And in the academic side of the house, often, it's the faculty issues and the educational issues, and perhaps rightly so, that rise, forgetting in some cases that critical members of the team are faculty. Uh, so is that, does that help the context a little, Gary? Is Maybe at NASA yeah. it'd be like engineers versus staff or pilots versus flight attend. I don't know. Yeah. No, that, you know. Completely, it makes complete sense, right? That's part of inclusion, right? To make sure um, to be able to understand where we're going and be engaged in those goals and know your part in that, you need to be included as part of that. And that makes complete sense to me. So. And then ultimately when that happens, and again, it's a journey. It's got to be education on both fronts you'll see the value because it'll be a higher performing organization, which is good for both. And it takes and leadership. Staff. It's what we all want, so. It's gonna take the leadership of chairs and deans Absolutely. to make sure that people view the team as being comprised of faculty and staff members. And I think in enlightened places that happens, we just have to, it's, a, it's an issue we have to always we have to work on. Yeah. Work on. Yeah, I, again, I come back to chairs are pretty critical in the operation of a university, and if chairs don't share it, have that value, it's gonna be a hard value to disseminate. So we need to make sure we're working with chairs to make sure they understand teams are inclusive. And again, I look it over at David as a, I, I see a handy dean. I would say, what is it, David, that you all do to create that team feeling between staff and, and faculty members? And they have to feel like their voice makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good, David. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, to, to be a best place to work in an inclusive environment, um, it's a tone from the top, and the leaders have to embrace that. And that's, that's, that's the journey. Um, I don't think any organization, there's not an organization that is a best place to work that doesn't have, if the leaders don't believe that. So it's it just. This is good. Uh, more questions, more observations. One over here. And I think um, maybe this is about, we're about at time, but. Yeah, I couldn't remember what time. Was. Afternoon, I'm Erin O'Toole from the libraries. Um, 
Regent Wright, I enjoyed your story about what happened at Southwest. And I've seen that happen in libraries again and again over the 14 years I've been here. But I also want to say it's my perception that when you tap people like that over and over again to go above and beyond their jobs, extra hours, making maybe take on additional duties for the six to nine months when we have a position open, they are less excited about contributing. And there's probably a tipping point where they're like, it's not worth my while to do this anymore. Um, I think we have that happen in libraries because we, partly because we're understaffed. A couple years ago, we were looking at our peer institutions. We have half the number of librarians that the University of Houston has. So I want to know if uh, the system and the, the universities are considering, as part of making this a better place to work, hiring more faculty or staff. I've got a really simple answer for that. As soon as we get some more money back, we can hire more faculty and staff. No, uh, I, I'm, I'm only partly kidding. Um, we're not resourced at the same level that University of Houston is, nor are we resourced at the same level Texas Tech is. Uh, we still don't have as many faculty members, that's full part-time instructors and non-instructors, FTE faculty, as we should have to be competitive with median tier one institutions. And we know we have staff shortfalls. And we know we have staff shortfalls in critical areas. We've taken some of those areas that are frontline, like advising. I mean, you know, it, much of student satisfaction hinges around the quality of their interaction with advisors who are, in many ways, the shepherds of their um, psyches and academic progress. But the truth is we're understaffed in a lot of areas. And, and you know that, it's true. Uh, the library is one of them. Uh, but I can point to some other areas out in, you know, other functional areas that aren't in academics, uh, especially right now in enrollment management in a couple areas where we're understaffed. Um, money fixes everything, so does efficiency. So our answer is we have to figure out where we can cut costs. Um, and, and, and this is going to sound bad, but that generally means a reduction of force where we can be more efficient if we're getting great shared services or something like that. And then also where we can grow revenues. But remember, when you grow revenues, you're growing your student population and that comes with attended costs. Uh, but we, we know we need more staff in certain critical areas. And I don't think we've done a really comprehensive study of where the workload is most unbalanced and I'm not quite sure how to approach it. Uh, I think in academics we have maybe some better models because we kind of know what the norms are with student FTE faculty to student ratios. So maybe we need to take a look into a comprehensive scan to determine where the workload is um, and, and the staffing ratios are the hardest. So uh, that's the best I've got. Money will help us. Uh, and we're spending down to the nubbins this year. Um, so I, I empathize, and I would say we have to not just look at libraries. We have to look across our entire system. But thanks. It's a, it's a valid comment. You don't want to burn people out. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. we, we got a She's microphone there. coming. Um, my name is Aisha. I'm in institutional compliance. Um, my question is more so, I, I, hear us, um, I hear a lot that we need more money, of course. Money helps all things. Um, but have you looked at other things? Um, I know you're looking at show services to see how you can combine things to save money. But have you looked at other things as far as preventative measures, um, as in, you know, to, to, to save money, like um, reducing turnover in certain areas? Um, reducing what? turnover as far oh, as retention yeah, yeah. of employees um, or even um, looking at what services you have currently that you could make more effective or put resources into to in turn get an investment get a return on your investment in that service um, to save more money. have you looked into that on that level so we're looking everywhere we can improve a process 
to see if we can do better. Uh, I, I would actually think that a really good outcome of today would be that where folks like you saw opportunity for us to um, have cost savings or to do some preventative work that would lead to cost savings, I would, we would value those recommendations Absolutely. coming forward. Now, we, we have a process, an internal process improvement group, and it's led by Terry, Debbie, and Brandy. Would you three stand up, please? If Terry, are you in the room? I know uh, there's, well, Debbie's there, and I saw Brandy must have just left because she was here earlier. Uh, we call them our talent team or our process improvement group. They're the, um, the funnel that takes in uh, any suggestions anyone has for how we can do better. Uh, so what I'll say is I, I can't sit and look at an org chart and say, well, we don't need those five people and we need four more over here. Um, and if we added one person there, it'd be make cost savings over here. That takes our VPs and a whole lot of other folks. I know Bob looks at that uh, on a regular basis. I'm sure others here do too. I think it's like Regent Wright said earlier, it's um, really kind of within. We, we know some of the best ideas are because you can see where there are opportunities yeah to get savings because we're doing things inefficiently or Waste. you know or we could make an investment here that would would have a, a great return right so i think we would love to get those please get those ideas in and uh, get them in it depends if it's system wide or if it's more kind of more at the university level so both are welcome and we would love to hear deb is there an email for that would you, would you hand Deb the microphone just so she can? Yeah, we can send out the talent team request uh, again. But if you just look up talent team on a web search for UNT, you'll find the web page that has the link where you could submit any ideas you want, and we'll get back to you. And we'd really love it. So I, I want to be as open to that and, and suggestions for how we can do better as possible. Thanks. All right. Um, I was going to entertain one more question if there was a pressing one, but I don't see any hands jumping up. Um, I want to offer uh, both our Chancellor and Regent Wright an opportunity to uh, summarize or conclude uh, the conversation that we had today, both about shared services. Uh, how, how do you feel about what we've done today, and uh, what do you hope for when we have these kinds of meetings? Well, I think as you talk about inclusion, right, and engagement, um, this is part of it, right? But it's really understanding from all of you um, what's going on, wh where, where can we do better, how can we better engage. Um, this is one way to engage. There, there's obviously with 10,000 employees across the whole system, um, not everybody's here. Uh, so, so clearly, um, there may be other ways to engage too. So we, we, I would like to know from all of you if this was, if this was helpful, if this is effective, because as we roll out some of these decisions and changes in the system, um, this is something I'm used to. Um, you know, I, I did this in NASA. I would go to all the NASA centers um, regularly, and we would also, I would meet with branch heads, I would meet department heads, I'd meet with early career folks, try, because perspectives are different, right? So we would work to kind of understand some of those and how we could understand what's happening and how we could make some changes. So hopefully that this, this is helpful and effective, but please give us feedback. And, and I really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, again, we're, we're gonna work to communicate what we're doing, changes we're doing. I, I send regular communications now um, on kind of what, all the things I'm working on. If you, th if you see some opportunities that you think we're missing, please send them our way. And I, and I just appreciate everybody being here today. So Great. Right. Laura? Yeah, I'll be short. Um, again, thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks for everything you do every day. So uh, because you have a great campus and uh, it doesn't just happen by itself. Um, again, I think we're, personally I'm very excited about Chancellor Rowe, excited about the council. There, We are definitely working to have the campuses work with the system. And it's a partnership. It's not going to be a us versus them, and we're, we're really here for the success of this organization and that other universities in the system, and it's a journey. Um, as I know we talked, um, I can't see the, the librarian, uh, the woman that works in the library, 
to become a best place to work, the leaders are going to have to do, we're we going to look at the results and we're going to have to do some th and make sure that we're addressing things that we have too. So it's a two-way street and uh, it's not a light switch flipped. It's going to take some time and, uh, um, you know, we appreciate your patience and I think it's exciting, you know, as we as we look to collaborate to make this the best university in the state of Texas. So. Yes. Hey. Hold it. And beyond. And beyond. And the All world. Right. <laughs> and beyond. And I just want to say, uh, it's never happened that we've had a regent and a chancellor uh, come and take open-ended questions uh, from an audience at this university that I know of. At least it hasn't happened since I've been here and probably for quite a while before that. Um, I want to really express my appreciation to your openness, to your candor, um, and to the fact that uh, this is part of a process, a process that is meant to surface our challenges and let us pull together to collectively deal with them. And I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you'll tell your friends that this was real. Um, this wasn't just a dog and pony show, uh, and that we will attempt as best we can to turn our conversation here into outcomes that matter. But that's the other part you have to remember. It's not like we meet once and everything's fixed. Um, I wish. It's a process. Uh, and it's going to take iterations. And we're going to have to come back and proof. You know, we, we made a change. How's that going? Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and hear your honest uh, opinions about it so that we know how we can work and improve together. So on that, I'd ask if you'd all give our two guests a great big round of applause. And it's Friday night, it's Mean Green Friday, and tomorrow and Sunday we're playing basketball, uh, men and women, so come cheer us on. Right. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great weekend, everybody. Good weekend.